building down there. But, uh, but anyway, so uh, Colm asked us to basically give a talk at like a one-on-one level uh, to a broad audience. Uh, so we'll see. I don't know when it comes to machine learning, I don't know what is one-on-one and what is like a thousand, but uh, I'll do my best. And this is super informal. So please feel free to just, uh, if you have questions, comments, uh, anything, just uh, please unmute yourself and, and, and uh, say what's on your mind. Uh, so as you know, simulating the climate system is challenging. A major source of the challenge is that we are dealing with the multi-scale, multi-physics system. And this cartoon here is just a reminder of the broad range of, uh, you, you see my mouse, right? You see the cursor, okay. The, the, the time scales and the length scales that we just have in the atmosphere, you can make similar cartoons for the ocean, for land, cryosphere, like the whole climate system together. And even though in many of the, uh, applications, we are interested in predicting what's going on here, the large and the slowest scales. Uh, and I'm going to call this X in the next few slides. Uh, we can't really ignore what's going on with the faster and the smaller scales that I'm going to call those Y because everything is not linearly interacting. And even though for many processes, we actually know to a good degree the equations that we need to solve, uh, we can do that because we simply don't have the computing power. For example, in a in a typical climate model that has a resolution of 100 kilometers, everything on this side has to be somehow represented. We can't just solve for it. So the traditional approach to this, as, uh, as you know, has been to basically use a coarse resolution solver at a resolution of 100 kilometers. Maybe now we can go down to uh, 20, 50 kilometers to solve for the larger scales. But to do this, we will need like a function I'm going to call P that is going to tell us something about those smaller scales as a function of larger scales. And this P is basically it's a parameterization, it's a closure model. And there has been a lot of work uh, and, and developing physics-based parameterization, semi-empirical parameterization, but we just know that we need better ones uh, for, uh, for many processes in the climate system if we want better uh, climate and better models. So in the past few years, there's been a lot of interest in uh, whether machine learning can help here. And there are many ways that machine learning uh, can be employed. One way is to actually follow this traditional approach, except that now instead of a physics-based parameterization, we might want to use some sort of data-informed or data-driven parameterization that I'm going to call B. And again, even if you choose to do this, there are various ways uh, to, to use machine learning. You might use it to estimate some of the better, uh, to better estimate some of the parameters in an exi uh, existing parameterization scheme, or uh, on the other end, completely leave it to like a neural network, for example, to learn the relationship between X and Y. So uh, if you are here, uh, probably you are already doing this for, for an important, uh, a process in the climate system for ocean turbulence, for clouds, for, for something with land or cryosphere. And as you probably know, in our group, uh, in our project, in data wave, we are interested in gravity waves. And um, Aditi, a couple of uh, months ago, I think, gave a great talk about uh, why gravity waves are important. And so I'm not going to go through the details, but these are waves that are excited by convection in the tropics, by fronts, by orography, and they go to higher altitudes and they break and they basically transport um, momentum and they have an important contribution to the energy and momentum balance. And they drive circulation like this uh, QBO in the tropical stratosphere, they affect the polar vortex variability. And so we, we, we are interested in uh, representing them correctly. And uh, the challenge is that these waves can be a small. Uh, so here, what I'm showing you is this high resolution one kilometer uh, simulation that we have done over marine continent uh, in a model called WARF. Uh, I'm showing you vertical wind at 50 kilometer altitude. And you can just see these beautiful gravity waves that were excited by convection and they're propagating. But here on this side, you see that basically how a typical climate model with a resolution of 100 kilometers would see this. It basically cannot capture these kind of waves. So as a result of that, in the GCM, we will need a parameterization uh, for these waves. And uh, so you have already heard about a few different things that uh, has been going on in, in data wave. And uh, Francois will talk about uh, some of the work in his group. But uh, in my group, uh, something that Chiang, who is actually here, has been doing is to build a library of these high resolution WARF simulations, different slices in time, different regions, to get data that we are going to later use uh, to, to do um, 
basically to develop uh, parameterizations. Uh, Claudia's group in MPI, uh, they have been doing global three kilometer resolution uh, simulations. And then these are still models, so they need validation. And uh, Aditi and, and, and Joan and in their groups, they are using balloons data. And Francois will also talk about uh, uh, data from other type of balloons. So the idea is to put these data together and develop uh, parameterizations. And like one of the things we want to do, uh, for example, Hamid, who is also here, he's going to start putting some of these into some of the climate models like NCARS VACM. And then we start looking at how QBO would behave, how the polar vortex variability would change and change and things like that. Okay, so what I talked about so far was basically following that traditional approach of uh, subgrid scale modeling. But also now with machine learning, there's been a lot of interest in doing fully data driven forecasting. And there are reasons that this can be interesting, that this uh, kind of approach can be very cheap. You can generate large ensembles, do probabilistic forecasting, improve data assimilation, and things like that. So I just want to mention that this is like the end of, at the end of uh, what people have been looking at with, uh, with machine learning. Uh, here, the idea is that forget F equals MA, forget PDEs, let's just go to the data and train, let's say a neural network to learn the evolution of the, of the state vector, maybe just focus on the larger scales. So for an initial condition at time T, we can predict the state at a later time and then put this back and autoregressively uh, move forward in time. There has been a lot of interest in this kind of approach too for better forecasting generally for turbulent flows. And there has been some progress. So currently the state of the art of this is this model called ForecastNet that uses a, a very fancy neural network called Fourier Neural Operator. And this is something that's developed by NVIDIA and my group uh, and a number of other groups has contributed to, have contributed to this. But it actually, uh, it has pretty uh, remarkable performance, I would say, something I didn't believe like three, four years ago that just by training on the reanalysis data, which is this data assimilated for the years of data that we have, you can actually do this. So here I'm showing you water vapor uh, in that era five reanalysis. And this is out of sample uh, forecast from ForecastNet. And you see that it actually doesn't have all the little details, but if you're interested in like atmospheric rivers making landfall in the West Coast in like even three, four days ahead, it can actually do a decent job. So these kind of, uh, you know, approaches have also been tried. And again, I think the performance has been, you know, better than what I expected. One thing to point out about something like ForecastNet is that it's 100,000 times cheaper and faster than the best model that is the, the ECMWF uh, numerical weather forecast model. Uh, and again, the performance in some variables and at some time is because it's already comparable. So there are applications that you can think of for this kind of approach too. So I would say there has been a lot of progress, but really to, to, to use this in operation and in practice, I think there are still a number of major challenges and questions that we need to address, uh, but also we can look at these as uh, opportunities for interdisciplinary research. Uh, so I want to talk about this a little bit more, uh, and I want to focus on the challenges that are actually, I think, physics questions. So many times when it comes to these kind of problems, people talk about the machine learning and the, the, the problems of uh, interpretability and extrapolation and things like that that the neural networks have uh, and generally machine learning techniques. I'll mention those, but also I think we should keep in mind that there are also a number of physics questions that we have. And uh, to give you an example, I think in many problems, it's actually not clear what is the thing we want to learn? What is the truth that we want to show the neural network uh, or any machine learning technique and say, this is the thing I want to learn. And even once you know that, and I'll give you examples, even if you say, well, this is the, like the subgrid scale term, this is a snapshot that I want to learn. There's a question of what aspect of it you want to learn. Do you just want to match patterns the way that we learn you know, about cats and dogs, or you want to do something more? And that choice, that information tells us actually what should be a loss function uh, in the machine learning technique and also the metrics that we choose for evaluation. So I think this is like an important question. It's, I think it's a purely physics question that the domain scientists need to, need to answer. So to give you uh, basically uh, an example of this, I'm going to use a two-dimensional turbulence uh, as a simple test case. It's something many of you might be familiar with. This is basically, uh, simple equations in vorticity and a stream function that at the modest Reynolds number, we can actually solve the equations without any uh, approximation and we can do direct numerical simulation. So let's say that direct 
numerical simulation is the truth. We are resolving everything that we need to resolve, and we have this data. So equivalent of what's done in climate modeling is to actually do what's called large eddy simulation, which is rather than resolving for everything, we are going to only resolve the largest scales. That's where the name comes from. So we know actually how to derive the equations for LES. Basically, we take these original equations and we low pass filter them. That's what this over bar is. And we know that we can basically get an equation that looks a lot like the original equation, except that at the end, we will get an extra term because of this nonlinearity. This is where sometimes it's written in terms of those prime terms. Uh, this is basically the subgrid scale term, like a Reynolds stress is a part of this term. And so the advantage of doing this is clear. While for DNS, we need very high resolution. Uh, we need uh, a high resolution grid. We need the small time steps. If you want to only solve for these over bar terms, the filter terms, uh, you can take, you can use a much coarser grid. You can take larger time steps. So the simulation is going to be much cheaper. But the problem is that we will need a model uh, for this pi. Uh, basically we need a parameterization or a closure. And again, there has been decades of work on this, starting from Smogronsky's work, that basically the idea has been that, well, this, what's here is mainly doing diffusion. So we are going to represent it some, with some sort of eddy viscosity model. And uh, again, this is currently what's used in, in weather and climate models, in turbulence modeling in general. But we know that with this kind of diffusive model, we might not be able to capture extreme events and many other important aspects of the, uh, of the atmosphere and ocean turbulence. So one idea, with machine learning is to, well, let's see if we can uh, train a machine learning technique like a neural network to learn the relation between this pi and the result flow from this DNS data. And so basically one thing we can try is that, for example, train a convolutional neural network. These are techniques that are for image processing. The input would be this result flow. The output would be this pi term. Uh, we can get the pi term from DNS. We train this and we see what we can get. So, so far everything probably looks pretty rigorous and something doable. But then we when we start doing this, we realize that, well, we say we'll use a low pass filter, but you can think of, all sorts of low pass filters. There are different types of filters. The filters need a lens scale. And uh, once you do this work, even in this 2D turbulent flow, you realize there is a lot of sensitivity to these choices. Now, I'm not going to go to the challenge of the 2D turbulence, but actually I'm going to go to our actual problem, which is this uh, gravity wave problem and show you some of the challenges that arise from just trying to figure out what is this pi term? What is the subgrid scale term that we are trying to learn? Because so in this work, we can treat this one kilometer resolution worf simulations as the truth, as the DNS. And let's say this is resolving everything and we have validated it with the balloon data. And you look at this and you say, okay, what is the term that I need to get out of this high resolution simulation and put it into this GCM so that you can get some of the things that we need correctly. So this is what uh, Qian basically has been working on in the past year or so. So we uh, have been looking at three methods uh, that uh, has been widely used in the LES community for this kind of work, or particularly in the gravity wave community. So there's a method that's basically Helmholtz decomposition, when you can separate the flow into a rotational part and a divergent part. Uh, you can do filtering and coarse graining to get the Reynolds stress, or you can just do filtering and coarse graining to get that subgrid scale term, the term that I showed. And there are different types of filters. We use three of the common filters, Gaussian filter, box filter, which is basically just doing averaging over a box, and then like a sharp spectral filter that you just cut in wave number space. Uh, but then this is what we get. Uh, so here I'm showing you the drag from the gravity waves that we get using these three techniques in two of the cases in those boxes that I showed in different regions in the tropics. And you see that the methods give vastly different answers in terms of what is the term that you actually need to learn. And uh, so you see that here, it seems that the Reynolds uh, stress method and the Helmholtz decomposition give similar results, but then you look at another case and you see that actually they're not. Here, there might be more similarity between this one and this other method. And these are just two uh, snapshots. But again, when we look at the PDFs and single type, we see that actually there are a lot of differences. So even to a start, it's not clear what is the term we want to learn. Uh, so it's not a question of getting a fancy neural network and add physics to it and things like that. It's actually the problem of 
what is the term we need to we need to learn here? Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, so I mean, the, the, the thing is, there are different types of filter choices, filter lengths, and uh, the issue is it's hard to know just what is right, uh, because there is this sensitivity. And uh, this is for the vertical flux. Actually, if we look at the horizontal fluxes that come from this lateral propagation, we actually see that those fluxes are actually pretty big, and they should be included in parameterization, something that all of the current parameterizations that at least use operationally ignore, but we see that even when we look, try to identify, to look at those horizontal fluxes, there is even more sensitivity to these choices of uh, filter type and filter size. So we have a paper that it's uh, about to be submitted that we actually report these results, these sensitivities to the extraction method, filter size, filter type, and also the importance of accounting for these lateral uh, propagations. And one thing I want to say is that, well, these sensitivities is not you know, just a gravity wave problem, even a problem as simple as 2D turbulence. The problem is there. If you look at ocean, I know that Lorazana's group uh, in the M2 lines, they are also looking at similar problems for, for the ocean turbulence. Uh, it's actually something uh, that we need to, another important issue here is that what is the effective resolution of the climate model? So the effective resolution of a model is not just the grid spacing, but the details of the numerics and how much numerical dissipation you have is actually something important. Uh, this becomes actually a more complicated problem when you are looking at a non-uniform grid, unstructured grid, there are complications in filtering and coarse graining arising from that. And again, this is not also just something relevant only for neural networks. So anytime you try to do supervised learning, offline learning, and you need to show the method, what is the truth, you actually have this problem. So even if you are trying to do like equation discovery, there is a question of what is the truth you show this technique. And here I'm emphasizing this because uh, uh, we also heard from like Greg Wagner and some other people in like the Klima, they use an online learning approach. And uh, so there are advantages in that method that actually you don't need to deal with this problem. But again, there are other issues to talk about. So anyway, I wanted to point it, uh, point it out this issue of even before starting doing machine learning, right, before thinking about all the issues that machine learning methods have, there are issues that I think just uh, purely physics uh, questions. Now, beyond just identifying what is the term that we want to learn. There's also there, there are these uh, problems about the metrics. Uh, for example, we have a couple of papers. We showed that uh, physics agnostic metrics, physics that are, for example, just based on looking at pattern correlation, what has been widely used in the machine learning community to see whether like you are getting the right image or not, actually can be highly misleading. You can get results that have 0.99 correlation, and then you put it into the model and it completely uh, blows up everything. And then when you look at physics aware metrics, uh, metrics that actually know something about energy transfer, entropy transfer, things like that, you actually think that you, you will see that those can be much more informative and tell us why those physics agnostic uh, metrics are bad. But also usually we choose metrics based on the loss function we use. Uh, and then so this suggests that we also should use loss functions that know something about the physics. And if you have a new paper, we show that you do that, you actually can do the training with a much smaller amount of data. And again, these are things that there are other people are thinking about. For example, uh, Laura's group, they, they have a paper that is actually about uh, suggesting some physics uh, aware uh, metrics to, uh, to look at subgrade scale modeling in the ocean turbulence. So my point is that probably a lot of uh, the stuff I'm talking about here, other people uh, across Vestry and, and Klima are also thinking about. Um, and uh, it would be good to chat more and be aware of these issues. So what I talked about so far, I actually I think there are problems at the intersection of GFD numerical analysis and climate physics uh, before even touching any neural networks and going to the problems that the neural networks have. So I realized that uh, it's almost at 20 minutes. So I can stop and we can chat and see if there's any question or I can move to one more slide and talk about some of the problems that arise from now trying to actually use machine learning and the, 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 the issues that the neural networks and machine learning techniques have. But anyway, maybe I should stop here and see. If there's well, any maybe, questions. maybe maybe give yourself another two or three minutes just to talk about that. I think that's very nice. I, you know, I have seen that uh, this before, but I think this is a very nice thing to put into context uh, the situation. So if you just keep going for another few minutes, uh, Pedro, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I think, again, what I talked about so far was just like, uh, what is the thing we want to learn? 
and what aspect of, an, of a pattern we want to learn. But let's say we figure that out and we know how to do that. Then there's the question of, well, what kind of machine learning method to use? And that is currently something pretty ad hoc. People use whatever method that they find uh, and uh, there's no theory to guide us. Beyond that, we have to figure out how to do the learning with the small data regime. Uh, and that's where it seems that adding uh, information from the PDEs, adding information from the physics can actually help a lot. Uh, interpretability is a major issue uh, to understand what the neural networks are learning and why, and can we do that better? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's something that we don't have a good framework uh, to do interpretability in terms of physics. Uh, generalization, which is really out of distribution generalization or extrapolation to a different climate, climate with a different forcing, a different circulation, is a major issue. Uh, we shouldn't expect these methods, whether it's a neural network or other kind of data-driven method, to extrapolate. Uh, these are the kind, this is the kind of problem you might see. This is in Rayleigh-Bernard convection when we expect a data-driven subgrade scale model to extrapolate to a 40 times higher Rayleigh number. And we see that very quickly the simulation just blows up. And in fact, instabilities are very common. Uh, when we coupled these uh, machine learning techniques, the data-driven methods with traditional numerical solvers. So I would say one reason that addressing these uh, three problems uh, has been difficult and the progress has been slow, is that we really don't have a rigorous framework to analyze neural networks. The way that in a numerical analysis, numerical analysis 101 class, we know how to calculate the stability of a numerical scheme. We know how to do that, how to calculate the, the accuracy and things like that. We currently don't have such framework for neural networks, particularly for deep, deep neural networks applied to uh, this kind of dynamical system data. So I think moving forward, uh, that's something to think about. And we have an approach based on looking at uh, doing Fourier analysis of neural networks that we think can actually help a lot. But I'm not going to go through the details of that here. So I stop here and it would be good to chat. And, and also I know Francois is going to talk about some uh, more details about the subgrade scale modeling and using the balloon data. Brilliant, uh, Pedro. Thank you uh, very much. So, so at this stage, does anybody have some? Uh, yeah. There we are. Does anybody have some uh, questions? You could put, oh, uh, put your hand up or, or put something in the chat. Any any question at this stage? Oh, yes, Dominic. Thanks very much for that, Pedro. Um, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about um, what kind of techniques you use to to make physics aware loss functions, um, like. Uh, yeah, kind of what kind of physical properties you bring in there? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And I think uh, it, it really depends on the problem. So something we have looked at, some other people have looked at, there are two types of physics that can be very helpful. One is if you have any symmetry in the system, include that symmetry, either in the data, do data augmentation. If you know that rotating the flow would rotate the subgrid scale term, do that on all of your samples and do data augmentation or use neural networks uh, that actually know about symmetries. So it's like these equivariant uh, neural networks that actually symmetries can be built into them, like rotational symmetry, mirror symmetry, things like that. The other type of physics that uh, we can build into our uh, the learning process through the loss function is like any kind of conservation law, for example, if we can uh, go back to these equations for the LES, and out of this, uh, we can form an equation, for example, for entropy, multiply the equation with another omega bar, or take the equation and form an equation for energy. And you can actually see what is the term that determines how much energy moves between the scales or entropy. And you can put something about that into the loss function as a, like a regularization or something fancier. And those things can help a lot because the loss function that is based on just matching patterns is really not going to get any information about uh, you know, the alignments in the, in the vorticity field and things like that. So anyway, it's a long answer to your question. That kind of information helps a lot. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I was expecting you to say something about conservation laws. So yeah, great, thank you. Well, any other question at this stage? Or perhaps we should, uh, uh, anyone? Anyone? Maybe we should uh, crack on to- uh, uh, Sorry, Colin, I have, here I have a follow-up question. Oh, great, great. Okay. In some way about the symmetries, because it's an interesting problem because 
What about the case in which your physics have uh, some symmetry, like the rotational symmetry, but your numerical scheme doesn't have a full symmetry? Which symmetry should, do you think we should then include into a loss function? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think it would really depend on the problem. But one thing, for example, we have been doing is that we have made sure that uh, whatever we use as the input and output are Galilean invariants. Uh, but also I heard like there was another group, they found that adding Galilean invariants actually reduced the accuracy and they realized that's because the numerical scheme didn't respect uh, Galilean invariants. So maybe that's sort of aligned with what you're asking. Uh, I think, and that's why I'm, I'm trying to say that we should also really start thinking more about just numerical analysis 101 in, in using machine learning techniques. So it's physics, numerical analysis, and then uh, machine learning, because at the end of the day, we want to couple these neural networks with numerical methods, right? We have their own issues and how errors grow and interact and things like that. Uh, and, and now you're brought up uh, symmetries. I think, I think those are very interesting questions. And uh, I think it really depends on each problem. And the second question about the instabilities. You know, do you think that part of the problem can be that we usually run us, you know, the calculations on the just on the verge of the stability. And then when we start to use the machine learning techniques, you know, it puts us randomly on that side of the stability curve or on that side of the stability curve. So are you uh, so are you are you talking about like the stability of the numerical method? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um yeah, I mean, it could be could be something related to that. Uh, so in our work, we have looked at two types of instability, one from the subgrid scale model coupled into the into the uh, numerical model. And there we found that the instability comes from backscattering, which is basically something like anti-diffusion. It just seems that you need much more data to learn this process, mm -hmm. OK? And uh, when you don't learn it well, because the small scales are forcing the larger scales, that can lead to instabilities. But also we have been looking at instabilities from like kind of model I mentioned, like forecast net, when it's just purely data driven. And there we understood that the instability comes from a spectral bias. So spectral bias is this problem that neural networks cannot learn high wave numbers or high frequencies because the way that the optimization is done. And when you are trying to like looking at a, like a multi-scale system that is nonlinear and has inverse cascade, not learning wave number a thousand at some point would affect wave number one or two, and that can lead to instabilities. So I think instabilities would re also be problem dependent and even happen when you are not coupling anything to a numerical model. Um, okay. Again, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's that's great, uh, Kasper. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. And that was a really uh, interesting uh, uh, talk. Uh, and great, just pitched perfectly to you ask my, my opinion. Um, and so now on to uh, Francois, who will tell us a bit more about uh, actually how you do the parameterizations. So Francois, let's see if your slides can load again. It's looking good. Okay. Okay, that's good. Okay, so... Um... The I would present the work we've been doing in the context of uh, Vesri data wave. So I, I I put here I recall here what is a data wave project has been that has been proposed, and um, uh, one of his focus is to improve uh, uh, the modeling capability for gravity waves and large scale circulations. And uh, an important aspect is to provide a new balloon data. And what we are going to, what I'm going to show here is quite different from what Pedro Am shows, is it to which extent uh, uh, we can use balloon data to validate uh, gravity wave scheme. And, I, and uh, for the moment we are using, uh, we're using quite conventional gravity wave schemes. So that's what I'm, I'm going to present. So I, uh, so I didn't understand what uh, core Comsil was telling by 101 level of the talk, so <laughs> you have to. <laughs> so I think it's 101, but Aditi may have talked about that earlier. What, what we're talking, we're trying to correct errors in climate and weather forecast model at quite, a, quite high altitude. In the middle altitudes, uh, the gravity waves uh, are very important to uh, close the mesospheric jet in the winter and summer by providing acceleration in the mesosphere that uh, 
that produce a brew adoption circulation. So that's one thing. And the other things for which we are going to be uh, which is going to be very important in the rest of the talk is about the quasi biennial oscillation in the tropics, which is documented here over more than 50 years. And you see that uh, I've shown it here to point uh, uh, thus, but I, I point two things which are uh, uh, important for climate model is that this from, from time to time, there is a stalling, most of the time, there is stalling of the westerly near above the tropopause. And I mention it because it's an important biases that climate model now has and that we would like to correct at some stage. It's what we call the systematic errors. And more recently, there, uh, there, there have been two of those, and I'll, I'll be talking to another case later. There have been this uh, disruption of the quasi biennial oscillation in 2016, and there have been another one in 2019, which I've been going to talk about, and which we would like to understand uh, better. Is, is it due to climate change on this kind of issue? So we're really uh, interested in that. So that's the kind of systematic errors we are going to correct and I want to correct. And in the tropics, the quasi biennial oscillation as a cause, which is well known, which is uh, uh, well explained by uh, the plum model for QBO, for the QBO, where it is just driven by, by, by a pair of gravity waves. Well, you have a gravity waves here. C1 is a phase speed, C2 is a phase speed. So put wave with positive phase speed when they propagate up have a tendency to, to, to give a positive acceleration. And, and, and so as you see here, and wave with negative phase speeds are, have a tendency to provide negative acceleration. And, and, and what's important is that uh, they break at different place. If you put, put the wind, we have a positive wind here. The distance between uh, the phase speed here and the wind is small. And it's like uh, 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 the water being small, gravity waves, break easily, where it has here the distance is very large, so the wave don't break, it's very easy for them to go up, and they break when, when the distance between phase speed and horizontal wind is not that large, and we call that mechanism dynamical filtering, and so they break at different altitude, and when you do that in a model, you have what, you have this kind of, of uh, 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 quasi biennial oscillation that, that occurs. And we use a lot of those uh, very simple model to, to, to test IDs in this uh, data wave uh, project. But the, so this, this, this is quite a full framework and it's, it's quite robust. But uh, so what's kind of wave in the tropic? An important fraction of the momentum is due to the gravity wave force by convection, and, and, and Pedram has show, shown us uh, more, uh, even um, better resolution than those one. I take an example from a, a whole paper by Lane in 2001, where there is uh, uh, convection over the Tiwi Island, and there is a lot of convection here, it's the humidity, and you see the system of gravity wave here developing at, 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 at 40 kilometers. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a section of 40 kilometers. And here's a vertical cross section of the vertical, oh, what did vertical Veolo city? It's interesting. It's a bicycle city, I don't know. And, and, uh, and the section should be around there. And what you see is that the, 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 how the phase line tilts with altitude. And this is for positive phase speed waves. And this is the, these are the negative phase speed waves. So the two waves uh, that we need for quasi biennial oscillations are, 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 are in part due to convection. But when we're doing parameterization and we want to represent those type of wave, we don't have to forget those ones, which are the equatorial waves and which are also very important in uh, the tropical regions and that we extract with very, a lot of detail. When, 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 when you reduce error by parameterize more waves, you have to take care that you don't uh, destroy other waves. And this is very sensitive. The first of them is the Kelvin waves and you see Here's a structure of the Kelvin waves, and you see it has a phase speed going eastward as expected for Kelvin waves. There is a lag in days, there's a composite, you see the temperature. And so it's a positive phase speed wave, and you see that it tilts in the vertical as a positive phase speed wave does. And I see, I, I show you a second uh, uh, a wave. Uh, it's a Rossby gravity wave at, at, at 20 kilometers. So you have those cyclonics and anticyclonic gyres centered at the equator. They propagate westward, as you can see here on this uh, uh, section, but you see that the amplitude is propagating eastward because the group velocity is horizontal group velocity and the fa horizontal phase speeds are, are, are of sign opposite. And you see here the vertical propagation, they are tilted 
in the direction toward the west. So the, the west were, as expected, west was wave that propagated. Up. You see that both Kelvin waves and Rosby Gravity waves uh, are, are dissipated in the QBO region. So they are important actors that we have to keep in mind. So now if we go to the parameterization of those waves, so those waves, we look at them very carefully. And this is an example. There was a program named the QBOI Initiative where we have diagnosed all those waves in a series of GCM. And you see a lot of variability. For instance, on the Rosby Gravity waves here, you see the packet of Rosby Gravity waves uh, <clears throat> at a given, as a function of time. And you see that between models, there is a lot of variability. And we have to keep that variability in mind between models. So how, how we are going to parameterize gravity waves. So we, we could, we, the, the problem is, is, is written here. We have to sample a vertical velocity field by a huge amount of wave numbers and frequency. And it is extremely expensive to do. And so, uh, so, 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 so we, we, the, 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 the community has been, uh, uh, of designing two type of scheme. One, uh, one of those, I'm not going to talk much about those, are what we name the globally spectral schemes and that, I, that are widely used, that use the spectral property uh, of the gravity waves breaking uh, to integrate the spectra analytically. And the other schemes try to sample the, these, these, these harmonics and we name the multi-wave scheme, wave by waves are very expensive. But uh, it appeared uh, about uh, 15, 10, 10, 10, 20 years ago that uh, if, you, if you have a stochastic approach, uh, which means that you don't consider that you have to, uh, uh, you, can, you can sample that, that, that spectrum stochastically and it became much cheaper. So how it works, you say that the gravity wave field here is a simple position of individual harmonics and uh, you have uh, intermittency coefficients and that, uh, that are just uh, probability that the wave field is made of that particular harmonic, but it doesn't matter much. So you can launch few of these waves each time step. And at the end of the day, you have a thousand of them and you have a good spectral resolution. So how do we do? The first thing we have to take care about waves. So there is a little bit of mathematics here is about vertical propagation. So we have an harmonics over a grid box, which is represented here, the individual harmonic as a vertical structures. This is due to the decrease in density with altitude, horizontal wave number, meridian wave number, frequency. And you're going to show them randomly because it's stochastic, few of them. And then you calculate the passage from one level to the next by saying that, well, the momentum flux transported by the wave is conserved from that level to the next except that it cannot go beyond a certain amplitude. And this amplitude is for which you have overturning. We call it just so you limit the amplitude of your wave to overturning. And the formula is here. And the omega you see here is intrinsic frequency. And it tells you exactly what I was telling before. When this is small, you cannot have a lot of momentum flux because the omega cube is small. When it is large, in amplitude, then you can have a large flux. So that property here is what we call dynamical filtering and is very important. And I think it's, uh, it may be well be a cause of the cor good correlation with measurement, which I'm going to show better. In those schemes, there's a lot of tunable parameters and, uh, 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 and, and, and machine learning could also, uh, some machine learning technique could also help us to choose better those parameters than, the, 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 than what we do uh, for the moment. So uh, you can re relate that to sources, for instance, precipitation, and uh, this is an important thing. You can say that you have eating in, you have diabetic eating, and then uh, you can distribute it over, over, over harmonics and uh, relate the gravity wave to their, to, to, to their source by simply putting some eating on the right hand side of, uh, of some Taylor Goldstein equation. What I put here, I put the eating here. And here you have a typical Taylor Goldstein equation for on the right hand side. And then you can have, you have an analytical expression. And, 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 and there is no issue. So it's, it's the, the relation between the, the, the theory of the momentum flux is clear and you can criticize it. The hypotheses are extremely clear. So 
Here I do, I first do some tests. We first are doing some tests with RIE and, 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 and some precipitation field. And we have precipitation field and we, and we have the stress amplitude that our scheme produce. And you see that how gravity wave stress are located, are very strong in, in, in very narrow regions. And, and there are plenty of regions where you have no gravity wave stress at, at all. And, and, and this contrast with the schemes that have no sources and that put the unif more uniform stress everywhere. So uh, here I'm showing the interest of doing that. So you put more uniform fluxes, and this will be important for the middle latitude as well. And you see that when you put all those uh, precipitation, uh, uh, you have uh, the gravity wave drag, you can tune it to a certain sense, positive gravity wave drag here. And here you have the QBO region, you have some gravity wave drag, so you want to improve the QBO. But when it's very intermittent, you have few large scale waves that makes the gravity wave drag here. So they break at lower altitude. Whereas if you want to put the same amount of gravity wave drag with a more uniform scheme, then you have a lot of waves, a lot more small amplitude wave that go very higher up. So you put more drag near above the stratopole. So that was an interest of having uh, this relation with the source within this scheme. Okay. <clears throat> And so we, we, we test that in the LMD, LMD ZGCM and, and was producing, and, and we think that that property helped to produce a quasi binal oscillation in our models. But now we turn out to validation of our schemes with uh, observations. And the first uh, observation data we have been taking were the Concordiazi balloon that were launched uh, around the Antarctic and that you see here and that goes at 20 kilometer altitudes and uh, that uh, out of which uh, the, the momentum flux were calculated and a very important property that those measurements were showing was that the uh, momentum flux which is on here on the x-axis was extremely intermittent with very few waves the probability of absolute momentum flux with few waves launching a large momentum flux and, uh, and many waves launching a small amount of, 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 of momentum flux. And then, so you have here, the parameterization is doing the about, could do about the same statistics as the balloons. And at a certain time, we're thinking that what the parameterization can do is having a statistical relation of that type. You, you, we were not thinking that the, 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 the validation could be better than statistical. So we have tried to see why uh, our schemes uh, were producing a good relation with that. And we realized that when we, when, we, when we make the statistics of the precipitation or square precipitation and another source term, which I don't talk about, which is about the mean latitude source. And you see that those things have this kind of intermittency. So this, this was telling that uh, a good part of the intermittency we have in the parameterization can be due to the fact that we relate the gravity wave to the sources. But now <clears throat> we have uh, more data and uh, we have uh, uh, other data uh, in the tropical region, which has the stratiol data and which I show here. So here, what I'm showing, the stratiol data, uh, uh, I'm going to show just in that direction. And what I'm going to do now is I'm doing a lot of offline testing of the scheme using era five where observed winds. And this, for instance, the QBO wind from era five and the gravity wave tendencies that I kept, that I calculate when I feed the schemes with error five data, you see a lot of uh, uh, decelerations when the wind shears are negative and acceleration when the wind shear is positive, which is a uh, canonical for uh, uh, gravity wave acceleration and deceleration of the quasi biennial oscillation. And do, you can do the same things and, 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 and tell yourself, is this, is this strategy of uh, looking at a, at a scheme offline representative of what occurs in real models. And you see here that the free running run with LMDZ have a, an a equally acceleration and deceleration in the positive and negative shear zone respectively, as in, the, as in there. And the amplitude is larger in a free running run, run that run by himself. And we also make the test in a strange thing, which is a, a, a model that you force to follow reanalysis. It's a, it's a, you know, it's things that people do. And uh, <clears throat> so here, um, I'm, 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 not, I'm, I'm going to, 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 to show you 
uh, measurements. So measurements that were done in that small period. And it's an interesting period. I don't see what I mean that. In that small period here, it's an interesting period because it's uh, it's um, months. Okay, it's not very good. But this period here, I should put the years. I forget to put the years. This period, you have the second Q quasi biennial oscillation disruption just here. And stratiol two data are 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 about, are, are about at about that that moment. But anyway. So we have the stratiol two flight, which are constant level flight, which are going to flight at about twenty kilometer of altitude, and, well, and, 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 and the loon data that we are going to use. So we are that's where that the, that the data wave project is is preparing and is uh, are going are flying at, I think at high altitude as those. And the flight in the stratosphere. So I, I show you uh, a balloon flight. You know, that we follow here in time. I never go. I never know if it goes in the in the right direction. My little animation. It's a, my, my my animation. But it doesn't really matter because sometimes the wind are east and, and sometimes the wind are from the west. And here, I'm going to. We are going to 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 take the uh, observations, the, the vertical profile of uh, zonal wind, meridional wind, and temperature, and the precipitation from era five. And we are, we are going to feed the scheme with those data and, and, and see what does what the scheme predicts. And it's uh, here. And you see for two flights, the red curves are for the prediction from the scheme and the black curves are the measured momentum fluxes. And you see that what, what first surprised us was that, well, the amplitude is not that bad. I mean, you have a scheme here that is producing a quasi, a quasi binary oscillation in a model and it was only tuned for that without no observations. And then you put some observ in situ observation and you have something which is not that bad. Plus there is some correlation. There are periods where you have large momentum flux predicted and large momentum flux measured. This is particularly obvious during the flight six. During the flight six, you have a lot of uh, drag in both uh, observations and, uh, and, and, and prediction. And then it, the, the drag decreased dramatically in the two. And this is because that this flight has been going over Sahil, Sahel. How do you say that in English? Sahel, Sahil. It's a desert in Africa. I don't know. And so there is no more convection, and so both uh, there is much less drag. We have been so you see, I, I represent systematically the east when it's positive and the westward flux when it's negative on top and on, on, on below. I, I've been talking about. Uh, Dynamical filtering, it's another case. It's a flight six, I think. I should have been writing here. No, the flight two, one, one or two. Flight two, it's not written, but I, I know it's flight two. And, uh, and you see here, the flight two, you see in red, the predictions. And you see uh, in, in black, the measurements. And you see that from the beginning of the, from the during the first 50 months, you have a certain values of both momentum flux. And then you see that the eastward fluxes uh, become large compared to the westward fluxes. And you see it's a period when the wind at the level of the balloon become negative. So it's a situation, as we have been talking before, where it's very easy for the wave to propagate up because there is a large distance, a large distance between the positive phase speed of the eastward waves and the negative winds. So you can have large amplitude waves which travel through. So we have been uh, analyzing systematically the the the, the, um, the summary of our whole flight about the amplitude of the stress out of the eight balloon flights we've analyzed analyzed here, and you see here for each balloon flight the east and west values for each flight, and you have a good correlation between the observed mean momentum flux and the predicted mean momentum flux over the balloon. Uh, with correlation, which are quite significant. But what is interesting is that the amplitude compare with really well. You have about 0 0.5 millipascal in here for the observed values and 0 0.5 for the uh, 0 0.4 for the for, for the for, for the predicted momentum flux. And what I put here, and which is where I, I prepared the slide this afternoon, so it was a little bit confused, and it's seen for east and west. What I put here are the values Average, sorry for going back. Averaged momentum flux, average in the eastward direction and in the westward direction. And you see 
it is also around minus 0 0.5. But here you have eight years of uh, of models or era five analysis average zonally. So that's what I call. So that's quite interesting that the value you show here in those few balloons is are, are not very far from the values that you uh, that that are the zonal and eight year average westward stress predicted by the parameterization. So they really uh, quantitatively can be used to uh, to predict the stress. <clears throat> Those balloon data. We have been uh, so uh, as we have seen that to, there is there are good correlate there are good correlation inside each flight between the measured values and uh, predicted values because there was convection and because there is dynamical filtering. So we can expect that inside each flight you have a significant correlation between prediction and measurements. And the, so, so we did we did that for each flight and we did that globally, and we see that. In the east and west direction, and it's 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 more significant in the in the east. Uh, you have uh, <clears throat> often a good, significant correlation from day to day uh, into the into the data. So it's, it's it's quite interesting. And 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 what's what's interesting also is I would bypass these figures. It's um, what what's interest. Yes, what's interesting here is. Before I, I was I was saying that okay we we, we validate the schemes uh, just from uh, stat, just the statistics of the gravity wave parameterization. I think that what tells those correlation is that we can go beyond and 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 satisfy and, and try to fit the predict the, the gravity wave scheme and observation on a few days to days basis. Uh, okay. I'm not going to test that here. It's a, so. Um, so what the conclusion is that uh, gravity waves routine tuned to produce a quasi binary oscillation GCM have about the right amplitude momentum fluxes in the tropics, and so that was something which that was not really truly measured so far. So that's a, I think it's an important outcome of this of this project of this uh, data wave project, and uh, other perspective that we have in the future, we are we are starting to. St to, 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 to test the gravity wave drag scheme that were used in all the Chibois models, but it's a bit uh, it's a bit surprising so so far. And, and uh, we have been discussing with Pedro is a is a, is a data is a DA scheme DA based scheme could be could be could be tested in the same way. And I, I don't have very precise ID so far. But what we're we're really going to do is to is to do bias in estimate uh, or, and 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 to 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 tune the scheme now that we have data that can be used for that. Okay, uh, we have to extend to loon balloons as said in the perspectives and uh, to the other gravity wave parameterizations because we we also parameterize frontal waves and non-gravity waves and the loon balloons are going to go all over those regions. Or I've been long, or I think I've finished. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much, Francois. That's uh, that's fantastic and uh, perfect uh, compliment to what uh, Pedram just talked about. Questions for this? Let me get uh, let me get my view so I can see. Do people, anybody want to put their hand up or got a question? Oh, Dominic. There we go, Dominic. Hello. Um, so the kind of numerical models that you started off with earlier, the, if you go back in, in the slides, um, uh, you were sort of building up the, the kind of PDE view of, of the QBEO. This um, one? No, no, the actual, the actual equations. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so perhaps I didn't digest all the details, but I'm kind of I'm I'm interested a bit in in what you're talking about the, the sort of the, the anomalies to the QBO, right? The 2015 2016 anomalies. Um, did did those anomalies lead to kind of revisiting these cut these this this style of numerical model and looking at the 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 sort of the influence in the model of like you know the 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 the, the winds the westerlies at different altitudes and things I was just kind of 
I'm thinking more like the, the human process of the science here. Like once those anomalies were detected in 2015, 20, 2016, did that cause a revisiting of, of this style of numerical model um, of the QBO? Uh, I don't, I, I don't, I, I, I don't think it, 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 I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm right, but uh, I'm not sure. So you see the two disruption, one is here and one is here. And sorry for the dates. Yeah, I should have put another slide. I'm not, so uh, I'm not sure that the, um, the, or, the, 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 those disruption challenge our understanding of the cause of the quasi biennial oscillations. We think that there was a lot of entering monumentum fluxes from the mid latitude, for instance, but the budget I have seen of those events, um, I think are not challenging much uh, those, the, 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 those issues. Okay. We still think that it's, yep. uh, it's, 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 it's driven. And for the gravity wave on the yeah. other end, so that's, that's one of the reasons we extended the offline calculation all along all along the all along the, the eight years duration, we didn't because maybe because we are underneath the disruption, we're flying underneath. We think that it doesn't; it's not really in, impacting our comparison to be during that period. So that's okay. So that's twenty. 20 oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's right. I, I can I can just make it out. Yeah. Okay. That that, that answers my question. Thanks. Any other question? Well, like, well, we see we picked the hour, but but certainly something that I'm curious Aditi about. Had a hand up. Go on. Oh, there is a hand up. I'm sorry. Yeah, Aditi. Aditi, please, Aditi. Yeah, I was I was just going to comment. Really, it wasn't so much of a question, but uh, I could be wrong, but I thought that the QBO disruptions were more associated with resolved waves, like Francois was saying, you know, from the exotropics, but also um, Laura, my postdoc has been playing around with all sorts of different crazy combinations of uh, gravity wave parameters and does find that with certain combinations, you can get more disruptions. So I think it's a, an, uh, an intriguing, um, if she has more time next year. <laughs> We might go down that far. Yeah, I mean, I, forgive me if I've I've kind of forgotten this bit, but has anyone published a a, a model that is basically able to kind of reproduce those anomalies in a in a kind of pretty close way um, without in in you know just from first principles as well? I think that might. I, I, I think it's when we tune models. Uh, I can tell you, I, I had version of uh, LMDZ6 with a lot of disruption, but we didn't want it. <laughs> but I mean, just these disruptions, right? Just the 2015, 2016, and not, you know, disruptions all over the place. Uh, then you need, a, you need a forecast model, because our climate models are, 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 are going to produce them statistically, uh, randomly. So how long you predict it in advance in a forecast model that is running ahead or something like that? Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I mean. Yeah. 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 No, I, I don't have the answer. As in, like, no one's done that yet, or you're not sure. No, 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 I, I, no. I don't. I don't say that. I don't. Uh... No, not I, I. I don't have the answer now. Yeah. Oh, Hamid is putting something on the chat. Oh, there's people people there's the QBO. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, great. Great. So that, that seems like something for us uh, to read. Uh, any further questions? Thanks for that, Hamid. So that's in cast. That's that's from um, that's from um, uh, forecast models. Yeah, that's different, but might be interesting. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm just curious. I mean, I think it's kind of a very interesting weather model to study, especially with this 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 disruption. Um, the, um, exploiting the power of the chairperson. I, I, I'd like to on your 
uh, perspectives uh, and conclusions, uh, uh, Francois. You mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Bayesian approaches. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? I'm very curious about how that would, uh, uh, what the opportunities are there. The, but the, your part is to, today we we, uh, we we parameterize those those uh, those scheme. We we choose those tuning parameters and. Uh, by hand, by you know, it's uh, it's experience. It's uh, yeah. you know, we we make it. But now we can uh, not not we ha we have this uh, this test bed, this offline test bed that you have seen there, where you run very fast over the uh, stratigraphic period, just one uh, one, uh, one 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 for one value of the of the tuning parameters. But now you can run, you can change those parameters uh, completely. You, you can put statistics on those parameters and uh, estimate the best fit of those parameters by all the technique uh, you have of, uh, of minimization. That's what I have in mind. You see what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you, brilliant. You, it, it, it takes two minutes now to run, to run, to run the parameterization over, over Stratiol. Of those stratal periods, and so just one set of parameters, so you can you can vary a lot of them. Fantastic, and and hot yeah. off the press is uh, further reading material from uh, Laura uh, Mansfield and uh, Aditi on the in James uh, on that very topic. yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, which is brilliant. Okay, so um, with more uh, to read, uh, I'd like to say thank you to our two uh, speakers. If you actually look at the diary the first tuesday in january is january the third which i think is a bit early uh, in the new year for us to be uh, getting together uh, so uh, look out for the invitations to the first uh, um, uh, first tuesday in february for the next uh, uh, next iteration of this thank you to everyone and to everyone have a great uh, holiday season and the rest of uh, of the um uh, AGU if you're there. So uh, thanks to everyone, particularly to our two speakers, and uh, see you again next year. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy and New if, Year. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Mm. And if thank you very much. If PI, if PIs want to, you know, get in touch to organise uh, a meeting with me to talk about things, then do just let me know. There was an email sent around recently by Marla. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we're going to be, yeah, we're, we're going to even more engaged with the PIs. It's going to be great. Okay, see you, DT. See you soon. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Happy holidays. Happy Thank holidays. you. Happy uh, New Year. Thank you.